welcome to another episode of Off the Menu. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with a homuncular Charles Coulomb. Homuncular? Homuncular, you mean to say, like a little man in a bottle, created by an alchemist? In a word? Yes. Who's the alchemist? <laughs> Don't ask these questions. Well, you know, if you're going to be giving an epithet, you need to be able to back it up. So... Chris well. Mr. Smart Guy. Oh, gee, oh, shut me <laughs> up. Well, you know, a lot more has been unveiled this evening than we ever intended. <laughs> I'm not, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first. The great Charles Coulomb was actually a homunculus who was created by the great Criswell in his, in his <laughs> laboratory, not his laboratory, his laboratory in, uh, at 6620 Selma Avenue in Hollywood. That's amazing. Nobody's ever accused him of being a, an alchemist before, although they occasionally made fun of his uh, predictions. But, you know, he was, uh, he was checked and double-checked, and he's 79% uh, correct. Really? Or 97. 97, yeah. 97. Well, yeah, look at all his predictions that came true. What were his predictions? Well, May West would be elected president in 1960. Okay. London would be destroyed by a meteorite in 1988. Pittsburgh, the population of Pittsburgh would turn cannibal. The first Americans on the moon would be pregnant women. Brain transplants would be available for vending machines by the, the end of the 1990s. And most accurate of all, the world would end on August 18th, 1999. Did you actually have an end of the world celebration on that day? I did. I sure did. And I was roundly denounced years later as an occultist for it. But, but it was written up in the New Yorker. And the, the, the fellow who wrote the account was a guy, a guy named John Whalen. And he said... As the last remaining revelers, I remember it very well. The article says, as the last remaining revelers left Borders at 2 a.m., Criswell's legacy was dealt yet another statistical blow. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, what's funny about that is that Borders today, it's been completely revamped. You, you, Criswell wouldn't recognize it. But at that time, it was the way it had been. And Whalen described it as the congenially moldering bar borders. I love that phrase, congenially moldering. And it, it, uh, the bartender at that time uh, had actually known Criswell and would sometimes carry him home when he was too uh, plastered to get there on his own. Because the Criswell house was very close to borders. So that is not that an uplifting story? And that's the man you claim created me as a homunculus. Wow, I hope you're proud of yourself. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I, I am proud of myself, yes. Well, good. I, I think, though, my, my favorite Criswell story, he was not part of, but your brother was. I know this one. You know this one? Go ahead. Well, no, I mean, it, it was, all right, you remember Bob Dornan. Of course, the politician. Yeah. Well, Bob Dornan, everybody thought of him as a congressman because, of course, he was, and a very good one. But when I was a boy in Hollywood in the 60s, living in the fabulous house of Criswell, he and Roy Elwell were the co-hosts, Elwell being the liberal and he being the conservative, of a show on Channel 9 called Tempo. What was funny about Tempo was that it ran through the day at intervals. So Tempo 1, I think, was 11 to 11.30. Tempo 2 was noon to 12.30. Tempo 3 was 1 to 1.30. Like that. You know, it, it was strange. Interspersed with uh, reruns of old television shows. Well, your, uh, your brother was really, really keen on hearing Dorn and me talk about politics. Now, the sad thing, though, was that at this juncture in his life, he's since become much more reconciled to the memory of the master. But at that particular time, 
your brother had heard enough of Criswell. It seemed like everywhere he and I would go together, we'd run into somebody, even in Biloxi, Mississippi, who had some weird connection to Criswell, and he, frankly, was sick of it. He had had enough. And I can understand that. I mean, if you never knew the man, you know, even if you weren't created by him out of a bottle, uh, you would still never forget him. But if you didn't know him, well, so what? You know, what's the big deal? But uh, we get to this, uh, to the uh, Santa Teresita Hall where this uh, gathering, this Catholic political thing was. And Dornan's standing there. So I go up to him and I said, you know, Mr. Dornan, your, your brother goes off to get coffee or something. I forget what. And Dornan uh, says to me, uh, uh, well, I said to him, rather, you know, Mr. Dornan, everyone thinks you're the congressman, but I think of you as the tempo man. And he says, tempo? Wow, that goes back a long time. Where were you in the 60s? And I said, well, in Hollywood, in the old Criswell house. And he says, Criswell, he was great. I had him on the show, I don't know how many times. He was amazing. He was just so bizarre. So we're going on and on swapping Criswell stories. Well, we're getting very, very animated, right? And as the stories get stranger and, and more bizarre, your brother, all he sees, because he can't hear anything, all he sees is Dorn and I, you know, like this, right? And he's got this look of real anticipation on his face. <laughs> I mean, it was almost hungry. He comes up, and what he hears is not me. But Dornan saying, so Criswell says to me, and the look on your brother's face turned to utter disgust, and he veered off. <laughs> it didn't even didn't even want to listen to Dornan. No, no, he, he didn't want to. He, 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 love was dead. He he didn't want to hear anything. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And afterwards, you know, he says to me, how is it? How is it everywhere? Even Dornan, how is this? I said, resistance is futile, Steve. You must join. <laughs> but he, uh, no, the, the, the thing is, he was a, a minor star of the Hollywood scene when I was a boy. And uh, people knew him. He was very bizarre. Uh, flamboyant is the word they used. And he did have a single accurate prediction, which he lived off for decades. And that was uh, on the Jack Parr show, on uh, the, t the Tonight Show as it was, before Johnny Carson. He said, I predict that President Kennedy will not run in 1964 because of something that will happen in November of 1963. He really said that? Yeah, he really did. Well, even a stop clock is right once or twice. Yeah, a yeah. But it's pretty Lucky specific. Guess, he, it's still pretty specific. Huh? That's still. Lucky guess, but he, he traded off that for years. I I would if I was in his position. Yeah, well, I'll see. Because, you know, the, the, the people in that apartment building were very interesting. Very interesting people. That's the best way I can put it. Unusual. Uh, my dad had the only, he was the only one who had a job outside. You know, everybody else either worked for home, from home or I don't know what, what unemployed. So my dad used to call the one they allowed to leave, <laughs> the one they let out. Wow. He, he, uh, he really was not happy being there. My father, I mean. He, uh, he could not wait to get us out of there. But it took money, and that took time. You know, so, but I'll tell you, when he had enough dough, uh, we were out of there. We moved out to the valley. But it took a good three years. And I, I have to admit, the strange people that would come to the house, the the uh, Sunday brunches that were so terribly embarrassing because of the bizarre people that came, uh, it, it did heighten my understanding of the October country. This this wonderful, strange place we've fallen into now. Hmm. Did you want me to read the October country little little snippet? Well, I did. Since since we're in October, ladies and gentlemen, 
I think it's time we, we made a certain seasonal, uh, what's the word? Tribute. That's the word I want, a seasonal tribute. So, yeah, if you would be so kind, uh, you could even show it if you want. Sure. Put it on but the uh, yeah. this is from Ray Bradbury, actually, who used the October Country as the title of a collection of his short stories. And he invented the phrase, the October Country. And it's, it's well, I, go ahead and read what he says mm. about it. October Country, that country where it is always turning late in the year, that country where the hills are fog and the rivers are mist, where noons go quickly, dusks and twilights linger, and midnights stay, that country composed in the main of cellars, subcellars, coal bins, closets, attics, and pantries, faced away from the sun. That country whose people are autumn people, thinking only autumn thoughts, whose people passing at night on the empty walks sound like rain. Isn't that lovely? Mm, that's nice. It's dark, but it's lovely. And it reminds me, and now people will perhaps squawk, but I don't care. One of my very favorite poems on the topic of October is by H.P. Lovecraft, and it is called, are you ready for the title? Yeah. October, in case you didn't know what it was about. But this is it, and I, it describes this time, I think, beautifully. Mellow-faced with eyes of fairy, wistful clad in tinted leaves, see the brown October tarry by the golden rows of sheaves. Oak and acorn in his garland, fruit and wineskin in his hands, mystic pilgrim from a far land down the road to fatherlands. Softly treading, gently breathing, casting spells on wood and wold, vines with purple clusters wreathing, witching bows to red and gold, bearing sicklemen their pleasure when the harvest toil is o'er, and the autumn's garnered treasure lies within the festive door. Bearing dreams to all who listen as he sounds his elfin horn, where the crystal vapors glisten past the farther hills at morn, where the sunset hovers playing on the teeming cottage yard, till the cryptic night comes straying in a mitre tall and starred. Dreams elusive and uncertain, fleeting as the dying year, glimpses from behind the curtain, half to cherish, half to fear. Memories that charm and beckon, Vanished scene and vanished face, phantoms past the worlds we reckon, reaching from the wells of space. Mounting is with necromancy, welcome visions hold the sight, bygone fields assail the fancy, radiant in a golden light. Ancient lanes lead cool and bending past remembered farms and byres, where the curling smoke ascending tells of happy autumn fires. I can catch the flaming riot of the oaks and elms I know, and the breathless ruddy quiet of the sunset's spectral glow, and the farmhouse chimney peeping through the scarlet maple shade, and the gorgeous fruits of reaping by the door in order laid. Greens that red and yellow dapple, tints that match the blazing sky, swelling pumpkin, rosy apple, clustered grapes of Tyrian dye, and behind the orchard reaching where the rolling meadows bide, I can see the corn shocks bleaching and the stubble stretching wide. Skies alive with southern winging ravens perched, perched on chief and stack. Groves with eager trumpets ringing as the quarry flees the pack. Swains with nuts and faggots plodding homeward to the twilight goth, soon to cluster warm and nodding round their cider and their hearth. Notes of village bells are soaring, peaceful in their vesper tune, as an eerie light comes pouring from the rising hunter's moon. Wild above the wooded mountains, weirdly shining on the streams, yellow floods from haunted fountains, witches dancing in the beams. Half-seen sights from out a distance, half-heard sounds from other spheres, beat with goblin-born insistence on the spirit's eyes and ears. Thoughts half-thought and yearnings sober, formless as the autumn smoke. These thy gifts, obscure October. These the symbols of thy yoke. Mellow-faced with eyes of fairy, wistful clad in tinted leaves, 
See the brown October tarry by the golden rows of sheaves. Oak and acorn in his garland, fruit and wineskin in his hands. Mystic pilgrim from a far land, down the road to fatherlands. Hmm. That's pretty neat, I think. That's a good one. It's So it is October, and we have some big feasts coming up, let me tell you. You're seeing this, if you're, uh, on, if you're seeing it on Monday, you are seeing this on the traditional feast of St. Teresa of Lisieux. So there. But wait, there's more. October has all sorts of goodies. October the 7th is the Feast of Our Lady of Rosary, Our Lady of Victory, which is, of course, as we all know. Are you ready? Can you dig it? Yeah. The Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, Our Lady of Victory, which commemorates Lepanto. The great battle. And wait, there's still more. October 21st is the Feast of Blessed Carl of Austria. And the last Sunday in October on the traditional calendar is, drum roll, the Feast of Christ the King. Mm. So October is quite a wonderful, uh, wonderful month as far as feast days go. And, of course, at the very end of the month, on October 31st, we have Halloween. Now, I will not ask people to wear their Heckle and Jekyll masks. But I am happy to say I did secure candy corn once again this year. Excellent. We did, we did make a little, had a little, little problem with it. We made a little mistake. What? tried popping it classic mistake don't try to pop candy corn ladies and gentlemen it won't do it and the worst place to try to do it's in the toaster what a mess it was it was terrible i mean awful stuff but october has come to its it has come to us and this is the beginning really of the festive time of year and I know every year I find myself saying this, but we really need these sorts of celebrations, especially now. What month is uh, October dedicated to? Uh, or excuse me, what what um what is October dedicated to on a Catholic calendar? How like June's month of sacred the month Heart? of the Ho- the month of the Holy Rosary. Ah, what was September? Uh, September was the well. So remember, has several: the month of the Holy Cross or the month of the Holy Angels. Mm. Oh, I see. Yeah, there was a big feast day last week on the. Um... Yeah, Michaelmas. We just had Michaelmas. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, great. Are you ready to roll into the state of the week? I guess. Is it a state I've been to before? Is it a state I want to go to? I think so. I'm pretty confident. Uh, on, on both? Pretty confident on both. Um, and I've been there. I want to go back. I, I would say so. So state of the week is Illinois. Oh, I do like Illinois. Yeah. Despite the, uh, the horrible scum that flows from its city hall. Uh, regardless of that, Chicago, Illinois will start there. It's got some really neat churches. St. John Cantius, of course. St. Thomas More. The uh, Ukrainian Cathedral. The uh, uh, Now, unfortunately, because of the elderly non-binary person, Cardinal Sipich, who runs it, the uh, Institute of Christ the King is no longer able to have public masses. But they still have their national headquarters there. And it could be, well, Cardinal Sipich is busy counting his money or looking at uh, strange magazines or whatever, that you might be able to slip in somewhere and get a traditional mass without her noticing. I mean, him, him noticing. Hmm. Okay. You might be able to get in somewhere. There's a, there are a number of interesting shrines, Mother Cabrini. Uh, downtown, Berghofs is a great old German restaurant in the Loop. The Loop is the old center of Chicago. And uh, there's a lot to see there. I I really, um, 
I really have enjoyed Chicago the times I've been there. I'd be lying if I said I didn't, despite the annoying uh, ecclesiastical and political government it has. They've gone down a long way since the time of Al Capone, I can tell you that. But what? I mean, in comparison to Al Capone or Daly, sure. I mean, the, or the original Daly, not the uh, cut rate imitations that cropped up after he died. Mm. And it's the same ecclesiastically. A lot of imitation, uh, decent people, no one real. But Chicago itself is a great place. The Chicagoans are a lot of fun, and they deserve a lot better than they get. But let's get out of the city, shall we? Let's move a little bit south. Uh, the Chicago area is very fortunate around the towns of Bourbonnais, St. Anne, Kankakee, uh, to have a French-Canadian area of settlement. They're very, very lucky. And St. Anne, uh, I believe St. Anne has a shrine to St. Anne, and a uh, miraculous image and things like that. St. Procopius is a Czech monastery in Lyle, Illinois. Um, and of course, Waukegan, uh, which is near Illinois, it's no, on the North Shore, north of Chicago, is the home of, you guessed it, Ray Bradbury. Ooh. Greentown. And there's also, you know, I've gotten blank, but there's an evangelical college in that part of the world, which has a big collection of Chesterton and C.S. Lewis stuff. And I can't think of the name of it for the life of me. It's senility. But if you go a bit further south, you'll encounter the land of Lincoln, Springfield, Illinois, the capital, the state capital. Lots of interesting um, stuff about Lincoln there. Now, if you hit the river, the Mississippi River, there are all sorts of interesting things. Galena, Mississippi, Galena, Illinois, which is a big river, a river port. Directly across from St. Louis is the town of Cahokia, which was founded by the French in 1699. And their church, which had, at least until recently, it may still a Tridentine Mass, the old 1699 church. is really worth seeing. There used to be some very beautiful churches in East St. Louis, but the population vanished, and they knocked down a lot of them. Near there also is the Shrine of Our Lady of the Snow in Belleville, Illinois. It's very modern, but it's still worth going to. Uh, you go a little bit further, you come to uh, Kaskaskia and Prairie de Roche, which again are old French colonial settlements and still have a taste of the mother country around them. Um, go much further south in, in Illinois, you come to Cairo, which is practically southern. Uh, Cairo and uh, Metropolis, which builds itself as the home of Superman. Wow, that's... I guess who's going to stop them? I don't know. No, well, nobody can stop them. The town is called Metropolis, and they took the name and kept it. Go on. No, nothing else except <laughs> that uh, they were the site of an old French settlement, Massac, Fort Massac. Uh, and, of course, the, the French were the, uh, the first settlers of Illinois. Uh, they're... They were pretty much overwhelmed by the Anglos, although they still survive, as I say, here and there. Most of the Indians of Illinois were sent off eventually to Oklahoma, where their descendants are now in the northeastern corner of Oklahoma. So Illinois is a very Indian-free state. And there you have it, the land of Lincoln. All right. Um, okay. Thank you, Charles. Uh, you want me to talk about Loyola University and you're annoyed because I left out the Jesuits. Why would I be annoyed because you left out the Jesuits? That doesn't even You love sense. the Jesuits. I. Yeah, you love them. You always root for Loyola. Against, in, the, in the high schools, the Catholic high schools, you even root for Loyola against Bishop Amat. Amat. 
That's a weird thing to say. That's a weird thing to say, Charles. All right, we're gonna we're gonna get away from this as fast as we can. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you Let's doing? Face. That's more to the point. What are you Let's doing? Face. Despite being a graduate of Bishop Amat, you have allowed your immense wealth and power to go to your head, and you have joined the Loyola Mafia of L.A. Catholics. Okay, firstly. <laughs> I didn't graduate from Bishop of Mott. I never went oh, to Bishop now, of Mott. Now you're, you're That's my brother who knowledge. went to Bishop of Mott. I went to Damien High School, and I'm proud of it. It's, Bishop of Mott sucks. Ah! Yeah, that's right. I said it. It's a football school. Yeah. Wow, cool. You have a good football team. Wow, congratulations. Anything else you got decent? No. Doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a coming, Weezy. I'm a coming. <laughs> I I don't believe this 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 outrageous assault on your poor brother's alma mater and him not around to defend it. And my sister's alma mater too. Yeah, she didn't play football. He didn't play football either. He played baseball. Well, see, neither of them did. Well, yeah, yeah I do. I knew your brother played baseball, but Mary Lynn did not play either football or baseball. That's right. Anyhow, she wasn't a jock. No, I didn't. think that's a good thing. That, that, that's a great thing. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's terrible. I, I don't know if you, I want you to meet my sister. She's a jock. <laughs> <sighs> but Loyola is a boys' school. Was Damien? Yes, that's right. All boys. Uh, so is Loyola. But Loyola has Jesuits. Did Damien? We had the Sacred Heart Fathers. See. Got you there. Wow. <laughs> I okay. I mean, I. But if, if it makes you feel better, we have them at Alabama also. Oh, okay. In fact, uh, your friend uh, Father Luke Zimmer, remember him? Of course. He he wasn't. He didn't teach at my school, at least not my time. But he was lived at the community house where they lived, hmm. where the, you know where the Sacred Hearts priests who taught at Alabama lived. Yeah. Have you ever wondered why you didn't go to Alamany? Never. Have you ever felt bad about it? No. I see. So basically, you don't really care about the West Valley of the 1970s. Boy, you hit the nail on the head, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> so for you, so what is basically what you're saying. West Valley in the seventies, you go jump. For all you <laughs> yes. Let me tell you something, pal. The movie Dazed and Confused was set in the Valley of the nineteen seventies. Wow! Exactly. You have nothing to compare to that. The San Gabriel Valley of the nineteen nineties. What movies? Are they? All you got was Joan of Arcadia. <sighs> exactly. Exactly. I got you there, smart guy. I feel so proud of myself. You know, it's these tiny triumphs that allow my very, very fragile ego to continue. I just want you to know that. Excellent. Excellent. I'm happy that can happen for you. Happy to contribute it. Yeah. On, the, on other, other news, though, speaking of Arcadia, oh, lordy, lordy, lordy. You won't believe it. What? But, well, uh, Chief Clancy's brother, Seamus Clancy, uh, has taken over the Arcadia Public Schools. And you know they now have a graduation rate of 100%. That's because... I... <laughs> <laughs> That's the highest in the state. <laughs> Everybody graduates. <laughs> and the other thing it's quite they've got a new program in the school it's called self-funding yeah well you know most public schools are purely done according to taxes right right well the problem is if you go to catholic school you pay the taxes but you also pay tuition right right so basically catholic school parents are paying double they're paying the tax, and they're paying tuition. Yeah. 
Well, Seamus Clancy, formerly Alderman Clancy, uh, came up with the bright idea that it was unfair for Catholic uh, school parents to have to pay double when public school parents worked at work, right? Mm -hmm. So now public school parents get to pay double too. I think that's fair. Equality, right? Exactly. And ever since this, the double payment program came in, everybody's graduated with flying colors. Well, that's, I mean, they're putting out a service and everyone gets the <laughs> everyone's service. And profiting. <laughs> everything, everyone's profiting. And that's how things work. I mean, I, it all makes sense to me, Charles. The kids, the kids have all have their A's. The, the one problem was that uh, back in June, the valedictorian at Arcadia High couldn't read his speech. But that was a little difficult. <laughs> He'd gotten an A, but he wasn't quite sure what the letter was. All right, Charles, before you besmirch <laughs> the, the great city of Arcadia. I, I no, it's it's Arcadia is wonderful. I I think that now that now that the uh now that the Clancy's have got in very seriously into city government, we can expect a lot more out of them. You just wait till Seamus is mayor of Arcadia. I can't wait. I mean it, all he has to do is keep it up and he's I mean he's showing he's a great administrator. I think it's wonderful. And I, you know, the problem is sometimes, you know about subsidiarity, sometimes things are best done on a, on a very small level, you know. So anyway, there there it is. On, uh, in other news, is there anything else going on? Well, you know, Tyrone wanted a raise. Uh, I don't know if he suggested this to you yet, but he mentioned it. And... The girls in the uh, the girls in the secretarial pool are getting ready for one of their two big feasts of the year. You know what it is? Uh, Turkey Lurkey Day. Turkey Lurkey Day. I don't know the they're, other one. They're getting ready. You just think it's a month and three weeks, less than two months away, and you'll have uh, Thanksgiving. Wonderful. Are you up for Turkey Lurkey Day? Of course. Of course. Then will come Christmas and the wheel of the year turns again. Hmm. Are we excited? We are excited. I can't wait for uh, baby New Year 2023. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's Damien in the Omen. <laughs> I I never I never trust a baby who's born with a full head of hair, open eyes, and a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's something wrong with that child. That boy that boy possessed. <laughs> Set him back. All right. Enough of this fall to roll to roll. What um, what do you have in the way of anything of questions? Yeah. Um all right. We uh the Jorgensen family sent in a bunch of questions. Uh first question. I um he uh I guess the uh, the father says I noticed when perusing Byzantine icons of Saint Christopher that he is often depicted with a dog's or wolf's head. This is pretty strange, and I was wondering what the reason for this unusual motif is. Is it the result of a little-known version of Saint Christopher's story, or does it have some kind of symbolic meaning? Both, actually. Hmm. Um. First, it was the idea that uh, there were a whole sort of dog-headed men, um, sort of almost werewolf types running around. And the Christopher was one of these. And when he met up with the Christ child, he was liberated from that condition and became a, a real boy, a real human being. But that, of course, is symbolic of the animal nature of man being uh, restrained civilized by Christ. Before we come to Christ, we are like animals, and afterwards we can become truly human. Hmm. Okay. Um, they also ask, um, they, I've recently finished the novel Forgotten Fire by Adam Bagdasarian. 
a true story about the Armenian genocide. I have now been reading more about Armenians and their history, culture, and ancient Christ Christian heritage, being one of the first countries to accept Christianity as their state religion. I'd like to know your take on, number one, Christianity in Armenia, their right being distinct from both Byzantine and Latin liturgies. Number two, the history of Armenia, especially concerning the Armenian genocide, which is sadly forgotten by most in the West. To quote Hitler, uh, he says, who now remembers, who now remembers the Armenians? Question mark. Uh, have you by any chance read Forgotten Fire? Uh, and thirdly, modern Armenia and its present state. Well, I haven't read Forgotten Fire, but I know a bit about the Armenians. Armenia was indeed the first country to become Catholic in 303 AD. <clears throat> first Catholic king, with the possible exception of the king of Edessa, uh, King Abgar, long, long before that. But other than him, the, the king of Armenia was the very first. Uh, when the Muslim invasions came, the, uh, the Muslims um, attacked Armenia. Uh, conquering parts of it. And there are to this day sort of Islamized Armenian populations in different places in the old, what was Armenia. Um, eventually, a lot of Armenian refugees fled uh, the Korolan Armenia, which is what is now independent Armenia and the adjoining areas of Turkey. Well, they fled into south, what's now southeastern Turkey, Cilicia. And a lot of them were there and formed an independent kingdom at the time of the Crusades. Um, the Armenian church went back and forth in communion with Rome. Uh, most of it broke off with the Council of Chalcedon uh, and were grouped with the Monophysite churches, the lesser or East or uh, Oriental Orthodox. But a number came back to the church at different times, and the relationship between Rome and the Armenian church right now is pretty good, actually. Their rite is quite different. It's in classical Armenian, uh, instead of an iconostasis or a, uh, or a rude screen or an altar rail, they have a veil that comes down and covers the altar uh, from profane sight. Um, the only difference in liturgy between the Catholic and the Gregorian Armenians is that the Gregorian Armenians do not add water to the Eucharistic wine. They're the only rite of any kind, Catholic or non-Catholic, that does that. Uh, and they are, the Armenian church is, of course, the heart and soul of the Armenian people. Mm. The... Um, Catholic Armenians have a religious order which is headquartered in Venice and Vienna called the Mechatarists, who look after most of their diaspora congregations, which we have two in the LA area, in uh, Glendale, oddly enough, and in uh, Boyle Heights. The other thing is that because of the genocide during and after World War I, the vast majority of Armenians left Turkey and sought refuge either in what became Soviet Armenia and is now independent Armenia, or they fled to places like Syria and Lebanon and Palestine, and from there all over the world. So you'll find large numbers of Armenians in the diaspora, so many in Glendale, California, that it's referred to as the second capital of Armenia. Uh, but Armenia itself is currently under attack by Azerbaijan because of Russia being bogged down in Ukraine. All right. Um, question from Don from Florida, who says, with the recent passing of Queen Elizabeth, the rightful Jacobite heirs in the House of Wittelsbach come to mind. Could Charles please discuss the history of the Wittelsbachs, their connection to the British crown, and their adherence and or devotion to our Catholic faith? Well, the Wittelsbachs are an old, old German family, and were originally the... the uh, the Counts Palatine of the Rhine, the Pfalz. One branch got Bavaria, then the Palatine branch turned Protestant, then it was defeated, and their territories went to the Catholic branch, 
were the electors uh, of Bavaria and had a right to vote in the imperial election for the Roman Emperor. Now, the way that the House of Stuart's claims came to them was that a daughter of um, Charles I married into the... Um, See, how did that work? Well, one of Charles I's female descendants married into the uh, House of Savoy, who became the kings of Sardinia. Now, uh, when Henry IX, Cardinal York, died in 1807, he was the, mass, the last male line Stuart, royal Stuart. So uh, his closest cousin was the king of Sardinia, Charles IV. Uh, Charles IV was childless, he advocated, he died, as did his brother Victor Emmanuel I. And so finally, Charles Felix was the last of the main line of the House of Savoy. He had no sons, so when he died in 1831, his claim to Sardinia went to his remote cousins, the Prince of Carignano, who were the ancestors of the current kings of Italy, and who were much more liberal than the old line. But his claims to the House of Stuart went to his oldest daughter, and she had married the Duke of Modena of Austria Este. Uh, they had a son, and he was the heir, and then he had no sons, but he had a daughter, and she married the Crown Prince of Bavaria. And that was how the uh, that was how their claims came to came to rest with the Wittelsbachs. Um, now they're going to move again because the current claimant is unmarried. In fact, I'm sorry to say he's in a uh, in a relationship that the German bishops would bless and the Belgian bishops would definitely bless, if you get my meaning. Uh, so he's a dead end, as you might say, for both the Wittelsbachs and the uh, Stuarts. His brother has no son, only daughters, so... The claim to Bavaria will go to a cousin. But the oldest daughter of the brother has married the son of the reigning prince of Liechtenstein. They have a son named Joseph Benzel, who will one day inherit what are now the Bavarian claims to the throne of England, Scotland, and Ireland. And that is where the future of the Jacobite heritage is, is with the princes of Liechtenstein. Um, the Wittelsbachs have been a great help to the church. Uh, they, of course, are the heart and soul of the Catholic League during the Thirty Years' War. And, like the Habsburgs with their Leopoldine and Schiftung, the, uh, the, the King of Bavaria with the Ludwigsfeldheim poured a good deal of money into the, United, into the church in the United States. Uh, so they've, they've generally done pretty well by us. And, Ludwig II uh, was very, what's the word I want, inspired by a trip to uh, Southern California. And so he built his castle of Neuschwanstein in imitation of Sleeping Beauty's castle at Disneyland. Of course. You didn't think it was the other way around, did you? No. Because Ludwig II lived in the 19th century. Yeah, so it, it makes sense for him to imitate Disney. Yeah. Yeah. It couldn't have been the other way. No. No. Because Disney was a thinker. <laughs> okay, go on. Well, I'm just saying, uh, Walt Disney was the great genius of Europe. He invented half the uh, architecture of Europe. And you can see it in various of his theme parks. Absolutely. And then they imitated it. Hmm. Okay. What? Is, it, is that it, Charles? Are we, are we moving on to the next question? I don't know. Did you watch The Wonderful World of Disney when you were a kid? No. All right, what kind question. of family did you have? 
I don't know. You want to talk to my mom about it? Yeah, I'll ask her why she wouldn't let you see Disney. All right. Uh, could Charles discuss the life and short reign of King Amadeo of Spain, the only king of Spain from the House of Savoy? Well, basically what happened with him, I don't know a lot about him. What I do know is that in the aftermath of the overthrow of Queen Isabel II of Spain in 1867, they <clears throat> looked around for someone to replace her, and they came up. They looked at Italy, which had been established as the liberal monarchy, and thought, well, let's get the brother of the king of Italy, or maybe it was his cousin, to be a liberal king in Spain. But <clears throat> as it turned out, Amadeo was not really keen on being a phony. So like Louis Philippe, he became too difficult to manage. They got rid of him. And that was the birth of the first Spanish Republic. And that was kind of a mess. So finally, there was a coup. And the son, Alfonso the Twelfth of uh, Isabella II, came back to Spain and became king. <clears throat> All right. A uh, final question from Don from Florida. Uh, he says, around election season, we always hear, from one side anyway, about the United States being the greatest country in the history of the world. While I disagree for numerous reasons, my question is, if we use the parameters of the greatest country being the one producing the most saints, who is the greatest country? The obvious answer would be our beloved Italia. But they have been a united country for a short period than the USA. So which country, kingdom, or region is the greatest under the criteria of producing the most saints? France. Honestly, Don, as a fellow Paisan, I, I would have thought you would have known better to not ask Charles this question. What? What do you want me to say? Tahiti? <laughs> I mean, look, stop and think for a second. All right. All of our military terms, where do they come from? You guessed it, French. Our legal terms, where do they come from? Oh, that's right, French. How about cuisine? Oh, yeah, I know, French. Wait a minute, we're not quite done yet. What about fashion? Ah, uh, French. Now, hold on, there's more. Uh, what about... Uh, Excuse me, cuisine? Great... Excuse me? Yes, cuisine. What, what do you think uh, Julia Child was uh, uh, the art of Norwegian cooking? Where, where are all the French restaurants? I don't understand. Yeah, I know there's no Italian restaurants every, anywhere to be found, but the French restaurants are just <laughs> around on every block. Well, no, of course not. It's, it's old cuisine. <laughs> okay. High cuisine. Yeah, high cuisine. You know, I mean, there are, McDo there are more McDonald's than there are Italian restaurants. What does that tell us? <laughs> there is a McDonald's on every corner. There's a Starbucks, too. Guess what? So what? All that tells you is that they're more common. It doesn't tell you anything about the quality. The fact is that well, French cuisine... You seem to say that French cuisine is the foundation for American cuisine in general. For everybody's cuisine. Every term you know in cooking comes from French. How about, all right, let me ask you a question. What is the red stuff you pour in your spaghetti? That's, that's actually, that's so not what true. Is, that's so not true. I don't have it in front of me, but you are factually not correct. What is the red stuff that you pour in your spaghetti? Sauce. Oh, what, what language does that come from? Dutch? No, I didn't think so. Let's let's all right. Let's try a meat question. What word does the word? What language does the word beef come from? You know, I, I don't know enough to debate you, but I I am pretty confident you're doing selective, uh, zo like zooming in on very selective. Do you things. think I would do that? Just I think to win I think I actually think you would. In this, in this very think specific, I'm that dishonest? Yeah. I, I think you are on this issue. Yes. All right, all right. I can prove to you my point. In which countries did Our Lady of Lourdes, Our Lady of Pomade, Our Lady of 
<laughs> Why should it just line up all the French apparitions and then ask which country did they appear in? Ignoring all the others, of course. <laughs> Even I can't do that. With <laughs> but no, I, I'm going to quote something to you from your brother. He told me many, many years ago, and I think it's important in this issue. All right. Are you ready? Okay, go ahead. If you accept my premises, my conclusions are easy. <laughs> that is one of my favorite of your brother's sayings. You know that? I remember that. I use it myself now. It's a pretty good term. A pretty really good is. phrase, yeah. It is. If you accept my premises, my conclusions are easy. <laughs> and in this particular case... I make the same claim, Mr. Italiano. Accept my premises and you'll get my conclusions immediately. That should make it easy. All right. So excluding France, of course, what, would, what would be the next greatest country? Spain. Okay. After Spain. Portugal. Okay, after Portugal. Oh, now we're fishing. Andorra. What is it you want? <laughs> uh, I, I want you to have to make a a more... I use more discretion, honestly. I feel like the you first three England? were obvious. Were obvious. It was obvious what you're going to oh, say. Oh, England. England. Okay. Interesting. Feel better now? I, I do feel better. Do you feel somehow confirmed in something or other? Sustained? <laughs> Sustained? No. The, your answers don't sustain me. Uh, well, I... That is sad. <laughs> See, what I want is for you to be busy at your uh, at your job, you know, up in the tower on the 27th floor. And you're suddenly filled with doubt or something like that. And then you remember one of my answers to these questions and you're sustained. You're, oh, that's right. Spain. And then you can go on with your day. All right. Next question is from Rob, who says, Greetings and salutations to the eminent Sir Charles and Don Vincenzo. Curious mm. about your thoughts on the morality of voting for the left in an effort to accelerate the process of decline and get us to the other side. No, 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 and no. And then no. And uh, no. I understand why accelerationism is attractive to some people. And in my wilder moments, I sometimes feel, as your Italian brethren would say, finita la commedia. Finish the comedy. Bring the whole thing down. I understand the impulse. But it's not really very smart, both practically and morally. Morally, because you can't vote, for instance, for pro boards, which the left all love. And practically, because, let's just put it this way, while accelerationism sounds good guess who gets to live through it or to put, put this another way if you pull the roof down over your head it'll demolish the building more quickly but you'll be hurt if you survive indeed all right um next question is going to be from me you um, now this is um I actually haven't written it down, but so I've been watching Downton Abbey. I've been enjoying it. Um by the way, if you were want to watch Downton Abbey, cover your ears cuz there's going to be spoilers. All right. Uh so um I'm about season 3. Um and uh so the the lord of the estate, Lord Grantham, um it sort of becomes apparent that I mean, I, I would say he has no concept of money. Um, so it's like the setting is like uh, it starts out about 19. I don't know. What's the year before World War One? 1914 or 1913, something? 1913. Yeah. So, um, um, you know, eventually sort of these uh, these estates uh, in England, I guess they're not, quote unquote, modern in terms of, like they're not modernized in terms of 
uh, just money goes out, you know, on spending on all of the servants and butlers and footmen and maids, but where's the money coming from, right? And so that kind of turns into a problem uh, for Lord Grantham and his, uh, I guess, an in-law is trying to modernize uh, to say, look, do you, look, buddy, you've got all this money going out and no money's coming in. And it doesn't seem to bother Lord Grantham as much initially. Um, and then so, but basically then they extend that to seem to imply that this was happening uh, nationwide to yeah. all the estates. Um, I know in Downton, a, a friend, a Scottish friend, they lose their estate because they didn't quote unquote modernize. Um, so I guess, is this accurate in a sense in terms of this upper class just kind of not knowing how to handle money? Uh, well, uh, see, the basis of their money was agriculture. And agriculture had been changing severely for the uh, 100 years before. Hmm. Um, and the the several things occurred to really revolutionize stuff. One was the uh, abolition of the Corn Laws in 1846 removed the protection that uh, British agricultural products had had, especially with regard to cheaper stuff from uh, their colonies, from Australia and Canada and South Africa and from the States and Argentina. Uh, the production, the invention of canning and refrigeration and the uh, increasing speed of things like railroads and shipping and all that uh, meant that uh, foreign products could be brought as, as cheaply or more so than homegrown. So this put the agriculturally based British upper classes into a real, real tailspin. During the course of the 19th century, some of them were fortunate enough to be able to go into coal mining and things like that if they had coal on their property. Uh, but if they didn't, they were kind of stuck. And so they had to do what he, what, um, he did. Uh, in terms of rationalizing, modernizing the means of production and so forth. Now, later on, uh, after the war, after World War I, and again, after World War II, these sorts of places would be targeted for destruction via taxation by the British government. And so that there'd be these incredible inheritance taxes, uh, which would often... Often the tax, the inheritance tax, would be higher than the income of a great house. And so today, there's still a number of these places in the hands of their old families, but a lot of them have been lost, um, and either knocked down, turned into hotels, or occupied by the new super rich, which is always sad. Or they've gone, they've become museums. You know, and of course, one way that you keep a place like that going is to admit the public. You know, they they generally to keep a state of that sort going, you need a combination of agriculture, hunting, tourism, uh, sometimes filmmaking, because you know you can get a lot of money if they use Highclere Castle, you got a real shot of cash from Downton Abbey. Hmm. I, and, I just, uh, you know. Also for events, weddings, and things like that. Interesting. I just thought of a, another question. It's kind of a theme uh, in the show, which is about change, right? Because it's it's sort of um, showing tradition and how to handle change, or how these people are trying to handle change, um, or or embracing change. Um, and one of the things that's interesting I've, I've never thought of is it's showing how um, the Great War changed the culture. Oh. Uh, and that's something that I haven't thought a lot about. It seems to have loosened the morals, kind of, kind of shook a lot of things loose here. Yeah. Could you talk about that a little bit? No, well, sure. I mean, the Great War was the beginning of the position we're in now. Uh, it shook up the, uh, and that was in every country, uh, 
even to a, to a small degree, the United States. I say a small degree because unlike World War II, which had a much greater effect, there was a limited number of American men who actually went over there. But even they, you know, there was the song uh, that became famous in 1919. It starts out, uh, this is an American song. Reuben, Reuben, I've been thinking the boys will soon be home. It's basically a farmer and his wife talking about their sons coming back. And the refrain is, how you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? How you going to keep them away from Broadway, jazzing around, doing the town? They'll never want to see a horse or a plow. And who the deuce can parley voo a cow? How you got it to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? Well, it was a much bigger effect, of course, in Europe. And of course, to have your brightest and best slaughtered in four short years was a tremendous trauma on all the European peoples. Uh, and that was true even if there wasn't a revolution that overthrew centuries-old governments the way they were in Russia with an attendant civil war following, Germany and the countries that were Austria-Hungary. Uh, it, 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 was, it was horrible. It was utterly horrible. And the results of that war are still with us to this day. It also damaged European self-confidence to a great degree. And that damage was further wrecked with the Second War. And of course, communism arising in Russia and then gobbling up half of Europe after World War II didn't help. Um, and then of course, ironically in 1968, 50 years after the end of the Great War, you have the great revolution of 68, the apogee of the hippie movement. Uh, you know, all of it, in a sense, connected. Um, one last thing, which is, is interesting, is, um, again, the way things are framed, you've got sort of the monarchists who are embracing tradition, uh, and embracing other, you know, their, um, how do I say, defensive of some of these other things. They feel threatened by the the quote-unquote wireless, the radio, yeah. uh, at first. Um, and, and, but the king is on it, so it, so that, it can't be all bad. It can't be all bad. Um, and so, I, yeah, I just got to that episode where they hear the king on the radio. And something changes to them. And there's sort of this notion of... Uh, the king is more mystical, in a sense, when he's just in your mind compared to you're just hearing his voice, and it's it's more real, I guess they say. No. But um, but it's interesting to see that you know, because like we've been dealing with liberalism, we've been dealing with modern nation modernization, but it's interesting to see those old timers kind of deal with it where just the structure of these mansions are being threatened where you know they're talking about footmen being outdated just the role of a footman just yeah. being gone what and you have this one character this gross american woman played by shirley mclean oh yeah where she's his, like his a hippie well what well, i didn't understand that character because she's like a hippie but if you do the math on her, she's coming out of the 1860s, not the 1960s. That's correct. So I didn't understand how that person could well, be, you know, what created America, that person? In America, there were a lot of weird movements in the 19th century, like the transcendentalists and so on. Yeah. And theosophy came out of the 19th century of America. And she was sort of part of that. By the character, I mean. Mm, yeah. Shirley MacLaine, of course, was part of all the crazy that came out of the 1960s. In real of course. Life. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was certainly the passing of a, of a whole way of life. 
Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was interesting you mentioned the, the um, mystical aspect of the monarchy. Um, the, with the accession of King Charles III two weeks ago, two weeks ago now, um, parts of the, whole, of the whole process that had never been televised before, the accession council and things like that, were televised. Now, when the queen was crowned, it was televised, but they did not televise her receiving communion or being anointed. And I am willing to wager that you will see that with King Charles. Because we're used to seeing everything now. Right. Nevertheless, I was, uh, I did something kind of amusing to me anyway, no one else. I, um, after the after the king's accession was first proclaimed at uh, at St James's Palace, uh, it was proclaimed all over Britain and the Empire and everywhere else this accession proclamation, and it had varying forms. But I, I thought of Downton Abbey because. The uh, the proclamation. This was the text. Okay, you ready? Whereas it is pleased Almighty God to call to His mercy our late Sovereign Lady Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. We therefore. This Lord spiritual and temporal of this realm and members of the House of Commons, together with other members of Her Late Majesty's Privy Council and representative of the realms of territories and territories, aldermen and citizens of London and others, do now hereby with one voice and consent of tongue and heart publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord Charles III, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of all his other realms and territories, King, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, to whom we do acknowledge all faith and obedience with humble affection, beseeching God by whom kings and queens do reign, to bless his majesty with long and happy years to reign over us. Given at St. James's Palace this 10th day of September, in the year of our Lord, 2022. God save the king. Well, that was said all over England, Scotland, Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and elsewhere. And what I thought was interesting about it was that despite the fact that it was that it was done on television, uh, I mean, and I was and recorded, I mean, I saw, as I say, I looked at numerous examples. Crowds turned out to watch it in real time. And I thought that was very interesting because it showed that they were connecting with something deep. And the language, of course, doesn't reflect political reality at all. The Lord's spiritual and temporal today are not the House of Lords even of 30 years ago when they got rid of most of the hereditary peers. And yet, if you just heard what I just read to you, you would think nothing had changed with the British Constitution since the Middle Ages. Do you think um, the, um, the ceremony, I guess, presumably coming next year, uh, with Charles is going to have an impactful change on the world? Hearts and minds? Well, I, I don't know how much it'll change it, but it'll certainly people will take notice, that's for sure. It'll be, I have no doubt, it'll be, well, you know, her funeral, I think, was the most widely watched uh, thing ever. Until now, oh, but, I mean, it's it's it. Like ever, like 
yeah. the most widely watched thing ever in the world. Ever. It was her funeral. So I would not be surprised if the coronation equals or tops that. Because the funeral is one thing, but a coronation is something new and, and, and amazing. And of course, now that the popes aren't crowned anymore, now that no Catholic kings are crowned, now that nobody's crowned except the British king, it becomes all the more important because this is something that was done in every country in Europe, from Portugal to Russia. And now even the monarchies don't do it. The only country that still does it is Britain. Not even the Pope does it anymore. The last one, last papal coronation was 1963. Wow. I didn't. I did not know the British monarchy was the last one. Yep. Why do you think that is? Well, I think because in in the other, monarchies, I mean, monarchy is what was very important, like Hungary, uh, like France, they were overthrown, and they're not there. Uh, monarchies like the three Scandinavian countries. And uh, Spain, Spain and Portugal have not had coronations for a very long time um, because of certain historical accidents. The three Scandinavian countries got rid of them in the 19th century as a uh, symbol of leaving behind absolutism. Uh, and of course, Russia and the Balkan countries went communist. So and they and even when they left communism, they didn't get their monarchies back. With the um, with the uh, uh, papal coronation, it's because of John Paul I, who refused to be crowned pope. You know, he was too humble, and then he died, and John Paul II couldn't do it after his predecessor so recently refused to. Benedict apparently fought with himself and other people over it. And ended up not doing it. And of course, Francis, uh, I think, wore a dunce cap or something. I forgot. Uh, no, seriously. It's a little bit, in church circles, anything that smacks of the secular, of secular royalty or of chivalry or whatever, is downgraded. It's the clericalism that the Pope always complains about and that he himself is such a great practitioner of. It's easiest to denounce evils when you practice them yourself. But truly, getting rid of the papal coronation, which was a sign of the, church, of the Pope's temporal rule, uh, was a definite sign of clericalization, of clericalism, without a doubt, as was eliminating most of the lay members of the uh, papal court, which Paul VI also did. Um, and it's funny, their idea of getting rid of clericalism is getting laymen to give out communion. But see, this kind of thing, they don't even think about. But the, the reason why popes were crowned was because they were the sovereigns of the papal states, and then after 1929, Vatican City. And up until 1969, there were laymen who were citizens of Vatican City. Is that peculiar for you? Yeah. I'll tell you why it was. In 1870, as you know, Rome fell to the Italian government. When that happened, the Roman nobility split in two. There were the whites who welcomed the new regime and turned their backs on the popes. And then there were the black nobility who refused to do so, would not recognize the new regime and stayed loyal to the Pope. Well, that really had a terrible effect on them because, you know, if you're a nobleman of that sort in those days, you're trained to go into the military, law, politics, etc. But if you don't recognize the government, you can't do any of that. So the black nobility 
were unable to exercise any of the functions that they were trained for. And their sons couldn't go into them. So, as a result of that, in 1929, when the Lateran Treaty was signed, the black nobility became citizens of the Vatican in, as a reward for what their fathers had gone through and sometimes themselves, because it wasn't that long a time, 1870 to 1929. Well, in 1969, Paul VI decided that that was no longer necessary, and he deprived them of their Vatican citizenship. That was a way of repaying them too, I guess. Hmm. What? Gratitude is a beautiful virtue. see all right um oh well, that's gonna do it for this episode uh, oh we can't not with what's happening all right let me ask you i'm gonna i'm gonna say five things and you tell me what they make you think of okay okay all right indian corn uh john wayne uh red and gold leaves Fall decorations, party decorations, jack o' lanterns, trick or treating, pumpkin pie, Thanksgiving, and dare I say it, apples and cider. Apples. <laughs> I don't. Uh... I'm drawing a blank on that one. We don't do bobbing for apples here. How about bobbing for french fries? That's a little weird. What? You never bobbed for french fries when you were a kid? You know what we have over here right now? We have some pumpkin spice lattes. Your favorite. You know what? I don't care. You didn't wa You didn't read what I put on on Twitter. <laughs> what would you put? I'm sorry. Oh, gosh. I'm sorry I didn't read your tweet. Uh... You should be. You should read every tweet I put out. And considering that I only put out about 25 a day, uh, I, I insist that you read every, each and every one of them. But uh, I will – hold on. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will tell you what I, what I said, what I read, what I did. Uh, and I'm I'm very proud that I came clean. Good. It's about time, Charles. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Uh, where are we? Here we go. Confession. Overwhelmed by autumn. I had a pumpkin spice latte at the Starbucks in Vienna's McKyler Plots. Oh, you got your fix. Yeah, I did. But man, am I being made to pay for it. Uh-oh. Uh, you sell out. You dirty sell out. You call yourself well, a distributist? Well, it's true. But see, this is what happened. Listen to this. Uh, Nicholas H.T. Vogt says, since you often talk about local American and foreign cuisine, Maybe a fall special listing of foods in order on the podcast. May I suggest featuring Frisch's Pumpkin Pie from Frisch's Big Boy back home in Cincinnati. Definitely also, sounds reasonable compared to these other foods. He also says uh, of what I said, a brave admission. And then uh, Petrus Ludwig says, I had one some years ago on my way to El Prado in Madrid. One hour I was ordering a pumpkin spice latte uh, at Starbucks. The next I was asking for directions to Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, such as the world we live in. Um, Kennedy Hall, who's Canadian, says, <clears throat> I happily make my wife her pumpkin spice flavored coffee every morning. I imagine as Christmas approaches, she will indulge in something of a festive sort. Warm hug in a cup, I say. <laughs> uh... <laughs> and then another uh, another fellow, uh, Mungo Cub, has Linus with welcome great pumpkin. 
Carl Hanig says, and haagen has a new variety, pumpkin ice cream with whole fruit. You know, thrifty ice cream used to, the thrifties, they used to come out with pumpkin ice cream in October and eggnog in December. I, I love those. Uh, Melody asks me if it was good. The answer is yes. See, these people are interested in what I'm doing, not like some people. And wait, there's more. Wow. He says, Keeper of the Domus says, Autumn has arrived in America, too. Best autumn weather we have had for years in my backyard. Just waiting for the leaves to catch on. We celebrated Michaelmas with a pumpkin walnut kalake roll I ordered from a Midwestern bakery. Delish. Oh, but wait. Ethan Yang says, off to the confession booth. And when you've done, redeem yourself at a proper Vienna coffee house. I went to the Cafe Havelka today, and I had Cafe Mitschlag. It was a melange. Okay, great. Simon M. Riley says, traitor. Uh, definitely a rigid Catholic says, that reminds me of the coffee I had in British Columbia back in October 98. I'll never let go of that memory. Oh, man. And so it goes. Uh, oh, the, uh, Andrew Cusack has this black guy shaking his head and saying, I'm not angry, just disappointed. Uh, Andreas Walzer says, was thinking about getting one as well today in Vienna. It always feels a little bad to give Starbucks money, though. Alexander Chugel, he says, I am appalled. What comes next? McDonald's burger instead of Verstel and Leberkäse? And my response was, uh, and then he says, it's a slippery slope. And my response to Alexander was, don't I know it? Bouillon cubes instead of frittatenzuppe. Mea maxima culpa. But as so long as Austrian McDonald's has no sausage with muffins, I'll be fine. Okay, a lot happening on your Twitter feed, Charles. But uh, no oh, Edward Habsburg, so I'm not impressed. All right. Oh, oh no, you're wrong. Oh, uh, I took. I gambled. So I gambled. You man, what a failure today. <laughs> that is so sad. What a loss. <laughs> okay, okay, go on. Let's. No, well, we actually uh, we tweeted back and forth about something entirely different. So it's you're half right. But I, I will, I will. Uh, say one more thing, and then I guess we'll have to close up. Are you ready? Can you take it? Hopefully, yes. Have we spoken about the real Don Steele? What? The real Don Steele. I don't know what that is. Not what, but who. Who? I'm glad you asked that. When I was a kid in the 60s and 70s, Don, the real Don Steele was a DJ on radio. I had KHJ. And 93KHJ. And he would intersperse his music from time to time with this hysterical woman shrieking, Tina Delgado is alive, alive! Well, he would start out and say, What do we know and believe? And then he'd play, Tina Delgado is alive, alive! Now, it was never explained who Tina Delgado was or what the whole thing meant. But he did this for many decades, and those of us who were in the know, you know, we'd shriek along, I guess. So today, activated by no particular reason I can imagine, uh, I often don't know why I do anything, and I'm happier as a result than most people. But I did make the comment, and I, I stand by this. What I said was, and this, I, I, I just think it, I'm willing to stand by it. I said, uh, now is the time. Ah, well, this is it, I think. Um, where is it? Come to me. It says, and I quote, I think the time has come when we all need to take stock of how we're honoring the memory of Tina Delgado. And I think that's important. I do. You don't. No, because Tina Delgado is alive. Are you sure? <laughs> Are you Do sure she's know? dead? How how no. could you be sure she's dead? 
the real Don Steele has been dead for years. So how do we know Tina Delgado is alive if the man who introduced us to her is uh, is dead? His wife, you know, they asked her after he died, who was Tina Delgado and what was the story with that? She said, he never told me. I have no idea. I don't understand how that can be. That's so, there's so, how can that question not be answered? I mean, I guess this is California, so, well, nobody cares. Yeah, enough, exactly. I guess. We, we, just, don't ask see, questions. We, no, it's not who cares. No, you see, you misread your own state terribly. It's not don't ask questions, who cares? It's we can live with the mystery. We're not these people who are driven crazy, these outsiders. I mean, are there Lemurians on Mount Shasta? Do Bigfoot uh, prowl uh, on northern forests? I, I disagree. I disagree. We're, we're I, willing to live with this. I, I think, no, I, I think Tim Burton in Ed Wood captured it perfectly, which is you don't question the madness. You don't question. You don't question. You you just everyone's crazy, so just go along with the crazy. And whatever you do, you don't question. And your look confirms that I just hit the nail on the head. Let me, let me tell you something. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but don't question the madness. <laughs> it's just I mean I I I you know the epitome of that was um when he, uh Ed Wood is in with uh, George Feist, you know, the, the, the movie maker, the, the cheap movie maker. Yeah. And so he says, uh, no, I know the movie. I got a poster. I changed my sex. And uh, he says, oh, well, is that going to be big here? It's not opening here. It's opening in Texas. Louisiana is going out. And he says, those repressed Okies, they dig that twisted, perverted stuff. <laughs> and if you think about it, a statement like that, <laughs> is beautifully Hollywood. You know, he knows it's wrong that he at once has contempt for them, but will take their money. Those repressed Okies, they go in for that twisted, perverted <laughs> stuff, which he is selling to. Them. I mean... <laughs> that is dead on. That's perfectly encapsulates Hollywood. It does. It does. And he says it in this matter of fact but contemptuous way. Oh, the, the, those repressed Okies. They go in for that twisted, perverted stuff. You know, it's like, well, you're, you're selling the movie. Would uh, would you ever watch it? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> that... And, I mean, it really, in so many ways, captured our, our great city. I think if you really want to feel, get a feeling for L.A., and you can only watch movies to do so, I would recommend three. Okay. The Rocketeer. Uh, L.A. Confidential. And Ed Wood. All th during the 90s. All three movies during the 90s. During the... Yeah. My favorite period. Wow. But okay. they, they caught the heart of our great city. Yeah. You know, I, I'm reminded of an old friend I had whose family had been in L.A. for generations. And he said to me, you know, L.A. is just a corrupt old cow town that acquired a veneer of Hollywood decadence. <laughs> 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 wow wow indeed <laughs> a veneer of Hollywood decadence it was so better so much better than the cowtown corruption it's concealing <laughs> you know <laughs> you may think I'm a prostitute but I'm really a forger <laughs> Well, what's that? So, cow town with veneer of Hollywood decadence. A corrupt old cow town with a veneer of Hollywood decadence. Hmm. I like that. Yeah, I do too. It's 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 our city and why we love it. 
<laughs> couldn't imagine Yule Hauser being exposed to that phrase and saying, that's amazing. <laughs> You mean, if you strip off the veneer of Hollywood decadence, you come up with a corrupt old cow town. <laughs> That's amazing. That's such a good Hugh Hauser. I could see him actually doing that and saying that exactly like that. Well, you know, Hugh Hauser visits L.A. Confidential. You know, <laughs> So you give these prostitutes uh, plastic surgery so they look like famous film stars? That's right, Yule. That's amazing. <laughs> this is like this is like that that uh, picture of you with the prostitute on the bus and the the what your dream of like that, uh, the happy driver, the happy driver Americana. looking backward, the Boy Scout and the prostitute on the bus, and the, and the fellow was looking back smiling. But see now you, you give me a real inspiration though, Yule Hauser. In L.A. Confidential, that that would be great. oh man, that'd be amazing. <laughs> so so you're a police uh, lieutenant, but you've taken over Mickey Cohen's uh, whole cocaine ring, haven't you? That's right, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's amazing. And you rub out any of his lieutenants who would try to carry out the trade independently. Oh, that's right, Boyle. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's really something. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Here in South Central California, South Central Los Angeles, California, where the Mickey Cohen's drug trade has been taken over by the LAPD. All smiles. That's amazing. <laughs> All right, Charles, we are out of time. Oh. <sighs> Yeah. Oh, well, I'll tell you what. I'll leave you all with this wonderful thought. Tomorrow is Sunday here in Austria, and I am going with my uh, various friends and classmates to the great shrine of Maria Zell, Magna Mater Austria, the great mother of Austria, much resorted to by people from all over the old empire where Blessed Emperor Carl and his wife went after their wedding, and where he made the famous statement to her, now we must begin to, help each, begin to help each other get to heaven. So I will be there tomorrow, and guess what, gang? You and Don Vinny and everybody we know will be prayed for. So God bless you all, and we shall see you later. Oh, I've got a question. That was good. We're okay. We're good, Charles. Unless you want Monday. to do it. I always want to do it. What if it's Monday? What if it's what Monday? Is Monday? What, what if it's Monday? What if it's Monday? It's off the menu? Well, what, what about the show you said? Maybe you're right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.